Welcome to episode number 18, The Great Stage book written by Greg Fernandez Jr. Today we're going to be covering chapter 9, The Suspicious uh, Activity. There's a section in the Sus Suspicious Activity chapter called In and Out, and we'll be covering that today. It is on pages in the hard copy book, uh, in the actual book 77, 78, and 79. My name is Dan Hennon. We'll be joined here with the author Greg Fernandez Jr. Also, we've got Sophia. Stephen and Catherine on the line for today's episode. How's everyone doing today? Doing good. Great, thanks, guys. Well, we've got an interesting chapter. You know, this whole this suspicious activity is a very interesting chapter. And then I like uh, the way, Greg, that you broke down this chapter into uh, easily digestible parts. And in today's section, although it's only two and a half pages, there's a lot in there. And uh, looking forward to this episode. But there's a lot of information here, and I think I want to uh, read a couple of paragraphs at a time. We'll be able to stop and kind of analyze it a little bit and take a deeper dive into it because uh, uh, there's a lot here going on behind the scenes that the, that the reader needs to understand as well. And I think this is a good; these episodes are a good companion to the to the book when when uh, someone's reading the book. This really adds oh, sheds oh, additional that, light. Absolutely. So it starts off with the uh, subtitle, In and Out. This is Chapter 9 in the book called Suspicious Activity. Continuing on, it's important to know who was in the Crowley residence on January 19, 2015, and why. And so this is just picking up, you know, the bodies were found on the 17th. And so the previously in this chapter, on the previous episode that we did for the podcast, we covered about what went on the, on the 19th. And this is, just remember, this is two days later. This is that Monday now. And so, who was in the house? Continuing on, Chris Klein claimed he was in the house with David's dad and brother. David's dad told Detective McKnight that was not true. Authorities respond by never following up on those conflicting statements. So, so right there, we, we're one paragraph in, and we've got conflicting stories. Um, you know, one can call them lies or half truths or, or whatever they are, but it's 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 mixed up. Continuing on. Another friend of David Crowley, Mason Hendricks, was one of several people in the house with Chris Klein on January 19, 2015. Hendricks also worked with David on the Gray State Project. Hendricks once told me the reason why the public received so little information a year after the deaths was because the Department of Homeland Security had to sign off on everything. Uh, let's stop there. What's the Department of Homeland Security have to do with, with any of this is the first question. Maybe Stephen could answer this as a former law enforcement officer. Um, he His call got dropped again. It did. Okay. Gotcha. Well, That's DHS right there. That's what, has to do. <laughs> That's what's going on here, Dan. I mean, just his statement alone saying that the DHS had to sign off on a Crowley case is beyond laughable. I mean... <laughs> It's ludicrous, it's ridiculous, and I'm pretty sure DHS has a whole lot better things to do. And the, the thing mean, to keep in mind uh, here is that it's a local, you know, this was a local, big, big time local case and, and state, potentially state case that drew the attention, but it was never in the federal realm, even though many of us suspected that it did have some impacts uh, in, in the federal government, but certainly not the DHS. Now, the thing about Mason Hendricks is that he doesn't follow this statement up by saying I'm just kidding or this is a joke or I'm just kind of exaggerating a little bit. This is actually what he said. He said this. And so once again, it, it gets back into the, the question of why are the Gray State guys who worked on the project, why are they involved with the investigation at all? Why are they involved with whatever was going on with the investigation. And they kept seeming to come out of the woodwork with information uh, that led the led us, uh, people looking at the case, uh, as if they were kind of on the leading edge. Uh, they were hearing the first words. They were hearing the breaking news story about the case uh, before things went public. They were always getting inside information was the sense that they left us with. Do we know why that would be? other than just the obvious reasons of, of trying to... I, I know we're dealing with narcissistic people to begin with, and, and everyone else is less than them, but they always gave us the feeling that, well, you guys don't know. You aren't in the know. You're not familiar with the case. You're not on the front lines 
uh, with his investigation. So that's the feeling I always uh, seem to get um, dealing with uh, comments like this. And How did that not raise red flags with Apple Valley? I mean, with them staying in constant contact like that and asking questions about how the case was going. I mean, anybody who watches a murder series or anything like that, they know that those who are offering help in the case and wanting to know every step of the way what's going on are usually the suspects. So do you yeah. guys think, too, that, uh, and I'll just jump in here quick, then I'll, then I'll bounce off for okay. a minute. You know, the, the law enforcement angle, I could see that. And we're going to touch on that in the next, in the next paragraph. It mentions, you know, maybe the FBI was involved. That, that at least makes sense. But Department of Homeland, to me, security, means to me that they're trying to drop the seed and plant the seed that this is a terroristic, uh, uh, possibly have with the, with, the, with the honor killing or with David and the, the Muslim angle is what he was trying to plant the seed. Uh, is that is that right, or is that by you know some kind of design, or or am I just off base there? Go ahead. Well, to me, the whole DHS thing it isn't it contradicts the whole murder suicide because why would they even be involved in that? There were no bombs. There was nothing terroristic that David supposedly had done at the crime scene. I mean, I, I there's nothing. But wasn't Wouldn't there, at the very very beginning, wasn't there um, insinuations that there was explosives or sub other things in the house, maybe booby-trapped? Um, you know, that's, that's, what, that's another angle that they tried to push, and maybe that's why they, you know, he used this phrase, uh, for, for instance, that David may have booby-trapped the house. Sean Wright is the one who said that the that if I kept looking at this case, that the DHS was going to put a microscope on me. So you have two different people here, Hendricks and Sean Wright, both talking about the DHS. That's pretty weird. And it's that just a little deflection. Yeah, they're, they're, just trying, they're trying to deflect. They're trying to take the focus off of themselves and then try to get you afraid so then you don't look or ask questions. And there's absolutely nothing I see, no reason at all in anything I see that, come on, the Department of Homeland Security, are you kidding me? They're not going to get involved yeah. in it. That would be ludicrous. Yeah, that's a, yeah absolutely. <laughs> But it's an intimidation thing, is it not, as far as oh, yeah. um, scaring us off? Attempt, yeah, I'd say Attempt. that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what they, <laughs> we thought, whereas we, we took that and, and almost laughed it off. But at this point, they still weren't, they didn't know that who they were dealing with here. That you know, we, we knew, we've been around the block before, all of us on different, different cases. And so we're like, well, that, that's, not, that's not how things work. So I still think at this point, when these comments were made, to, to Greg is that they still were under the impression that we were novice uh, you know, armchair individuals, mm -hmm. not, not knowing the, the big picture here is what I think they thought. They really tried to use the intimidation right away and bullying, and that's, you know, no, they found out very fast that that wasn't going to work. Yep. Now, we got to go back to the beginning. We're, we're, we're still on January 19th. Why was anyone in the house at all yeah, they except should. for the cleaners? Yeah. Hey guys, I don't want to interrupt, but it's it's like the arsonist, you know, he sits in the back of the crowd and watches the building burn down. He's now a fire watcher. He's gonna, you know, it's the same with these guys. But the friction they're giving you guys just it was intimidation, and you know, you guys aren't buying it. Um, yeah, and DHS is not even they don't even care. I agree. Are there, are there any reasons why the DHS would be involved? I mean, what 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 would it take? I guess, for the DHS to be involved in something like this. Ter terrorism. Ter terrorism. Terrorist act. So there again, it's almost like Mason you know, puts his foot in his mouth when he says that because if this is a murder-suicide, there is no terrorism, per se. Mm -hmm. And so I think he tried to create that angle to get everyone uh, you know, scared, you know, as far as who did this, and it was some kind of nasty thing, and then realize, oops, that doesn't agree with my narrative, so... He hit too late to walk back. Walk that back then. So I don't know. I also wonder if there's any value in me contacting 
the DHS and seeing getting a getting a clear statement from them. Well, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, it won't hurt. Try it. Worst this is, no, but it's interesting. <clears throat> Just don't mention Philip Haney. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. On the other side of California, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they knew that they had people that were giving them different stories, and I never understood why they didn't follow up on it. Did they all like have their suspect? Why would they even bother to follow up on it? I mean, isn't lying to police, isn't that something? I mean, you have to be under oath maybe or something, but lying to police, ob- obstructing a case, I mean, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe there's no legal, nothing legally wrong with that, but still lying, um, more lies. A lot of people in this case have, have lied, and here we have more proof of people lying. The police know all this. It doesn't, doesn't bother them, I guess. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a, was brush, a, a former brush. law enforcement. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. I mean, it could be obstruction if they want to go that way, but, you know, the more we look at it, the more they're all involved in it, so they're not going to do that. And, Stephen, as a former uh, police officer, uh, you what, what comes to mind when you start hearing lies or discrepancies in someone's uh, statement or statements or something like that? It raises your antenna. Isn't that what you're taught to begin with? That there shouldn't be any lies. There may be misstatements, but outright lies like this. I was in the house with these two people, and they said, no, that's not true. As a police officer, if you're wearing that cap as, as a detective, even though you may have already have your suspect and the case is closed, that would still raise your eyebrow as to what would cause someone to, uh, to lie. Why would you make that statement like that? Um, do you think their ears perked up on that, or do you think they didn't even care? You know what? I don't know. I think they don't care is way past. I mean, this is a conspiracy. You know, we're not finding the answers. We have, we have mutilation. We have a sloppy crime scene. We have Freemasons and, and everything else involved. And, you know, and you guys are pushing it. And these guys, are, the friction you're getting from these other fellas, right, and, and Hendrix and everything else, I mean, you know, why, walk away. They're not walking away. Every time, every time you, you go at them, they, you know, it's, they're going to rebut it or whatever. Um, and it's way, I think it's past their 15 minutes of fame maybe, too. You know what I mean? I mean, there's there's some, there's some other motives involved with these guys. They they saw, they had they had stars, you know, in their eyes. I mean, this was a good project. So um, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but I really think it's coming together. Continuing on, it says Detective Gummert stated the DHS was not involved in the investigation. Hendricks also tried to tell me the FBI was involved. Again, Detective Gummert stated that was not true. And so we've got. You know, previously, when the star sh- uh, show started, we talked about Detective McKnight, and now we got Detective Gummert. So we're not getting these discrepancies uh, uh, with the same officer each time. They're with different people, and they know lies or misinformation is being um, uh, sent out or, or seeded or planted the seeds. And so um, it's interesting how many of the detectives here are, are involved with just for coming first coming you know, face-to-face with the actual lies that were being done in a case uh, like this. It wasn't just, you know, one, you know, one bad guy or, or one person that something slipped through the cracks, but it's over and over a multitude of the entire staff. Now it goes on to say that Mason Hendricks stated he and a group of others searched the house and the attic on January 19th, looking for anything that would help them understand why David was guilty. Uh, where do we want to jump off on this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're they're, 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 they're going to go a, collect whatever evidence they left for something behind. I mean, mm-hmm. you know. So when, if, they're, if they're in the attic, yeah. if they're in the attic on January nineteenth, they don't they don't see any bullet there. Touche. The uh, uh, at one point, Mason Hendricks uh, told me that. Uh, and this is Dan, he told me that they were there kind of cleaning things up and getting things ready to for the family, um, Sidra, uh, maybe the Alam family, organizing some of the belongings that Kamel had. You know, they were trying to organize uh, things. Uh, they didn't, he didn't mention anything about being in the, in the attic and searching for stuff. Yeah, 
Right. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, those are two, yeah, two separate dates. They spin off on two separate you know, times around the house, but I got them backed in on the, on the date. And once again, um, they used two different reasons why we're in their house, and it turned out to be the same day, which relates back to that 911 call from neighbors when the cleaners uh, weren't done or even maybe not even started yet. Uh, the question remains, why were they in the house at all? Um, whether they're gathering things or whether they're cleaning or, I mean, or, or searching for things, any co correspondence we had with those individuals on this, we kept hearing that they were all in mourning and in a state of uh, emotional uh, and not to get involved with this because they're so they're so busy trying to just gather this, uh, understand it all. But yeah, we find out later that they were you know in the house doing things, and um, they weren't mourning at all, as far as I know. Yeah, it doesn't no, seem like it. And, you know, the fact that they go right away and they're saying that they're trying to find a reason why David was guilty, oh, woe is them. And it, it's just not the behavior of people who, I mean, if that was your friend, how many of us would, you know, just find it and take it upon ourselves to walk into our friend's house that hasn't even been cleaned up yet just so we can start our own investigation when the police haven't just barely begun theirs and then turn around and condemn others who are trying to, to say, hey, this stuff isn't adding up. You know, they turn, you know, they want to condemn us and attack us because we're looking at this and saying, hey, this isn't right. But then they want us to feel sorry for them because, oh, they went into the house the next day or two days later. It's, it's just insane. Well, it's like what you said earlier. It's all just deflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the yeah. other thing I was going to add... Go ahead. Um, the other thing I was going to add is when I first confronted Mason with this, uh, I said the cleaners weren't done yet, and that was, it was still, one could call it a biohazard scene. Yep. The smell would have been sure. so bad. Uh, yep. There could have been uh, you know, maggots, in, insects in the house. From, from This is three weeks of decay is what... Oh, oh sure. sorry back then. I said, how can you go in there? What was it like? And I said, what kind of masks did you use when you entered the house? I said, Mason, you know how bad the house would have smelt? And you were in there fooling around. I said, the hazardous team or the cleaning crew hasn't even been there yet to, to essentially defumigate. And, and it would have been a rotting corpses in that house. And so I got him stumbled there when, he's, when he couldn't answer the fact of what kind of headgear or mask was he, was he wearing or oxygen supply when he went into that house. So alluded to, they had nothing on. They wore nothing. And, and I I've, seen, I've, awful. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, Dan, I've, I've seen a few bodies after a couple of weeks. And usually it was like spring or towards summer. But it was, you know, in the Bay Area, and it's not super hot. And, uh, too, you know, you can't even... It's usually somebody calls from upstairs in an apartment after two weeks. That's how bad it is. And you go in there with Vicks under your nose, and let me tell you something. It, you just you hit it on the nose. Absolutely. It's horrendous. It's sense of being credible. Oh, my God. Yeah. It really is. And, and decomp is a smell you just never forget, and it's not something that right. the average person will be able to walk in and just go, oh, wow, okay, look, it kind of smells funny. It is yeah. so overpowering. Oh. And here's the thing is we know that these bodies were not there for three weeks, but the rate of decay, especially in the facial areas and stuff, because it was open, open cavities, is going to be a little bit faster in those. So it would have been a very pungent smell. And, um, you know, yeah, no, I don't, the guy's so full of hot air. Oh, sorry. So it, so it goes back to the... The concept in my mind is he needed to have something on over his, his face, which he said he did, didn't. But he said that they're in there organizing and cleaning and getting prepared for whatever. And then also the line that he gave here was they were investigating and searching. Well, either one of those, they never mentioned having anything on as far as a mask or having trouble to breathe or how horrendous it was. None, none of that was even mentioned. And so that's where my antenna was, was raised right from the beginning. Mm -hmm that and the fact that the professional cleaners hadn't even come through there. God. So all of it, you know, on its, on its face, uh, none of this makes any sense. Mm -hmm. No, not, 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 one, not one bit of it. 
But he also helps prove our, our point here, too, is that he was, they were in the house, they were looking for things, and guess what they found to prove David guilty? Absolutely nothing. Yep. That's right. <laughs> you know, guys, maybe also they went in there to plant more evidence hoping the cops might come back in. You know what I mean? There's Bingo. also that. Maybe evidence Bingo. to, to, to defer, defer them. Uh, you know, I mean, these guys got egos. They could have, you know, it's like, it's like the fire watcher, man. You know, these guys' egos, they might want to play this little cat and mouse game. You know, and, and but does that, A, tell me that they have protection at a higher level, or B, that they're just egomaniacs? Yeah. And they might have wanted to plant something, too. Yeah, there's two good reasons why that really makes sense is because at that point, January 19th, they haven't found uh, two very important bullets. They haven't found the bullet that ties to Rania, and they haven't found the bullet that ties to to David. And one, we could even say they really never found the bullet that ties to to David's blood. We definitely know that. But So, I mean, it's hard to argue at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know what... um, and that bullet, we, that one bullet they found, looked like, didn't look like it hit anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So did they shoot that into something else and then just put it in there? Um, continuing on the top of page 78, it says that Hendricks claimed he walked in the house with at least two other people on that day. Hendricks looked up at the ceiling and immediately saw the bullet hole. Quote, I looked over to another friend of ours, Hendricks told me over the phone, continuing on, and I was like, they couldn't effing see the hole right there, question mark, end quote. So this is, now he admits to being in the house on the 19th, and then they said they saw the bullet hole, and they can't believe the police missed it. So how did they know that the well, that's the very first question that when they announced that, when they were you know, posting back and forth on our page on the Justice Group, was uh, we saw that the, they missed a bullet hole, and it was so amazing. And, and, and most of us asked them, how do you know what the investigators saw or didn't see? How do you know they missed anything? Mm-hmm. How do you know what they missed? How do you know what they saw? And so right then, it, it, it got them backed into a corner because how do you... You know, how do you how do you get out of that? How how did you know that what they saw and what they didn't see? And so that was them you know, trying they, to plant the seed that there was a missing yeah. hole that something the police missed, meaning exactly. that they know that it wasn't there on the seventeenth. Is what my, that's mm-hmm. how what I took from it. Yep. Well, at the same time, throwing the Apple Valley Police Department under the bus. Now, this is the nineteenth, and I, the guys at this point were getting prepared to do an interview with Fox Nine News regarding this case. Remember, they were, they were so busy grieving that they didn't have time to do anything. I think it was the very next day is when they did the interview that aired on TV uh, a couple nights later. That was either the 20th or the 21st. So they were getting prepped to do that at the same time trying to plant the seed here of a, of a boat hole all of a sudden. So their wheels were turning. They were, they were thinking nonstop uh, about how to cover all the different angles uh, of their tracks, I think. Is this the same interview that they did that where they turned around and did the photo op afterwards? The photo that is oh, the photo in the group? Uh, the smiling guy's photo? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, that was, that the, was the day guy. that photo was taken, yes. Ah, interesting. And do you know who these guys remind me of? Their body, their body language? Chris Watts. Oh, it's yeah. Cool. And I don't buy it at all. I don't buy anything they have to say. They do not have the, the right response. Their body's not responding. Their face is not responding in a way a real grieving friend would, just like Chris Watts. And and so the, Mason, the, Mason, the Mason interview, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the Mason interview, I looked at his eyes and such. It was like, you know, there was almost hatred and jealousy and, you know, David did it. He just went nuts and... You know, he still looks like he's so confirmed on that, you know. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's the, 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 the Danny August the Mason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The one he did with, with Ben Swan? I think so. The one, yeah, the one, the one he's, he's profiled off the camera there. Where he couldn't sit yeah, still and he was all shifty? 
you can probably notice he never did anyone after, any interviews after that, as far as I know. Hey, you know what, guys, though? Let's, 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 let's take Eagle and look into it. And I know that um, it was Dan Mason who didn't, sign, didn't want to sign the, the NDA on, the, on this. But I, I read the excuses in your book and everything, and it, it's all horse crap. But, um, I mean, these egos, they're, just, they're so driven. And I, 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 I just say i got to look at some security behind that, which, like I said, brings it up a level. But, I, I mean, these guys are so brazen. It's, it, it, it amazes me in a case that like this. I agree. Yeah, I don't know why they just didn't stay silent the whole time. Why are, why are they out there doing this, talking about this stuff? They they know people are going to be like, well, wait a minute. Like, nothing has really been done yet. What, what are you guys talking about? What do you guys know yeah. or claim to know mm-hmm. that everybody else doesn't know? On well, here, here, here's, here's the other thing, too. I, I pull cases all the time. I just went to the DA on the case. He won't tell me anything but two things, who's involved and what, what the weapon was. That's all I need. I don't need anything else. But, you know, the cops don't talk to people. This doesn't get into the, you know, it doesn't get into the paper. I mean, the reports, it's confidential for, it could be for months. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's not public information. The call, the call to the houses, what's in the report, investigation, and these guys are coming up with, I mean, it's like they took the whole thing over, you know, like you're saying. Uh, and um, the information they're getting should never have been uh, exposed. And that's what's amazing to me is that these guys, and, and every move that one guy makes, they all make, you know, they're, just, they're all in it together. Yeah, and it's so yeah. typical of narcissists. They want to inject themselves into something, even especially those who are involved in a particular crime. They want they they have to. Their ego doesn't let them do anything else. Their narcissism, so they will inject themselves and then say stuff to make themselves sound important, and yet the police never thought twice to go, "Hey, wait a second, your behavior's not matching what what we're seeing." Yeah. So, yeah. At that point, I do fault the ABPD, but, you know, again, at the same time, I gave them a break because this had been their first, well, there were three murders, but the first murder case they had handled in over six or seven years at this point. So they probably yeah. were like newbies once again. And I think you know what? It, took advantage. I know. You know, Catherine, is the only thing related to the Marshall case, you know, there's three bodies there, too. You know, and, and it, it's, it was a shadow ops, a black ops hit, and this and that. And like I said, the difference, the difference between the two homicides are or is one sloppy and one was, uh, you know, surgical. That's yep. it. I mean, everything else, you know, so where's the motive? Where does it stop? In Calvary's County, you know, you have my reputation up there for 30 years, um, is they've, they've always been corrupt. You know, for a short time, I don't think they were, but more or less, yeah, all those counties. And they cover up. An agency comes in like that, and, you know, the CIA or whoever it is, Homeland Security, DHS, they're going to they're take it over. And Calvary is going to go with the narrative. And yeah. we talked about Kevin Raggio, and I knew Kevin Raggio, and, you know, and, I, you know, uh, this was all covered up. So same here, Apple Valley, you know, and they got these knuckleheads running around wrecking crime scenes and stuff and finding bullets and all sorts of crap. I mean, that, that's just, this is so abnormal, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah. Um, continuing on, it says, how did Hendricks know the police missed the bullet hole? More so, why didn't Hendricks or anyone else in the house with him inform authorities about the bullet hole? Especially if they knew that police were unaware. See, that's another thing. We, we never get them saying, boy, we found this bullet hole. And, you know, five minutes later when I called police, you know, this and that happened. They never contacted the police. Uh, they never contacted anyone. They were just so jumping up and down, excited that they found something that the police failed at. Uh, uh, they're willing to throw them under the bus for this, uh, while at the same time being set up for uh, potential interviews as the close family friends of these guys, of the victims, and how uh, sombering this whole thing was, and what an emotional wreck they all are. Well, <clears throat> it's, just, it's just bizarre. Now, Hendricks, Hendricks was wrong when he claimed David's blood was on the bullet. He was wrong when he said it was proven that item 57 came from David's gun. He was wrong when he said David's fingerprints were on the gun. He was wrong when he stated the Christmas t- uh, tree was blocking the bullet hole in the living room ceiling on, July, on January 17, 2015. Hendricks was wrong when he stated DHS and FBI had to sign off before the public could get information from authorities. So there's a lot there to digest. Uh, Greg, do you want to go over that a little bit uh, in your book? Yeah, as I mean, far as uh, all the locations 
that he was wrong? Yeah. He was, he was, he was wrong in all these things. This is what, he, what he's telling me. So when I first talked to him, I know um, we, uh, we have the, the text between me and, and Hendrix, and we definitely need to do a show on that and go, go over that and start posting a lot of that stuff. But this paragraph here is pretty much the summary of what I grabbed from a lot of the stuff that he told me while we were texting and a lot of stuff that he told me while we were talking. Um, and so I had noted all of these things and to see if, okay, well, if, if they had all of this, then this, these are all things that would prove David guilty. So if the police would have said, yeah, yeah, we have David's blood on this bullet. Yeah, we have David's, you know, we know that item 57 came from David's gun. Yeah, we know we have David's fingerprints here. His fingerprints were there. There was a few other places. Hendrick said that the fingerprints were on the laptop, that there were footprints all over that house, that there were, um, there were bombs, that the, the police called bomb, bomb squad. There was a few other lies, a few other things that Hendrick told me that all ended up not to be true. And at, at, at that point, it's like, well, okay, first of all, why should I take anything that you say seriously? And that's why a lot of the stuff I ended up taking out of this book because it's like, well, I don't want to get into the he said, she said thing. It's like, dude, you're wrong. You are completely wrong. The facts prove you wrong. So I just wanted to kind of keep it as a very summary because that could have probably been 20, 30 pages just in that <laughs> that one section there of his quotes and of him trying to explain to me why David was, was guilty. So if this is his reasoning why David was guilty, um, he was wrong on that, and then he's helped prove our point that David isn't, so, isn't guilty. And at that point, Hendricks should know that. So there's a difference uh, that we bring up a lot of times in various cases like this is there's two different words one is misinformation and one is disinformation and the only difference between those two in a case like this is the word intent misinformation is someone got something wrong um, he thought it was right and, and it wasn't right disinformation is saying something purposely to sidetrack or to derail the conversation or derail the investigation on purpose and so right here, Greg, you've got five, six, seven instances of, of Mason Hendricks, what I call using disinformation on purpose to lead you down the wrong track. And uh, did he ever come back and say that, oh, he got it wrong or it was misinformation or, or, or he apologized for getting it wrong? Uh, no. Did he ever do anything like that? Because you got him busted here on all these cases directly from the evidence from the case, the, the right. police report. No. No, because by the by the time that that we had gotten all of the data that proved it, um, you know, I, I had I had stopped talking to him because I don't talk with people that lie to me. Um, you know, if if you want to tell me your story, if you want to contact me and tell me what happened with David, if you were there, if you have some information, et cetera, et cetera, I'll give you that time. I gave a lot of these goons that time to tell me that. But once they started lying to me, then I'm just going to document it and I'm going to call you out on it. And that's pretty much all that happened there. So by the, by the time that we actually got that stuff, and, and if he ever does want to do something live, if, if Hendrix ever, you know, has the courage to actually, you know, do something live where we actually go through these things that we're talking about here, he is more than then then welcome to contact me um you can go to the gray stage at gmail.com and he can send me something there and he can he can counter any of the stuff that we're saying here this is all factual stuff that he said um that he has been proven wrong on. so i would love for him to come out and say you know what i was wrong you guys are right because that's that's what, what the truth is. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting the whole the whole thing because uh, he was coming at you you know hot and heavy with all these all these phrases from the beginning, and then once the police report and the evidence and everything came out, we we got it, and then was able to to go through and dissect each one of these and really leaves us with the question of uh, you know did he just happen to get it <clears throat> just get it wrong. 
or uh, was this done on purpose to lead you down the, uh, uh, the wrong path? So, you know, yeah, at one point he says it's it's obvious that the police missed the hole. You know, anyone could see the hole. And then he says, well, the Christmas tree was in the way, so maybe that's why they missed it. And so he's, he makes contradictory statements uh, like that as well. You know, the, uh, David's blood was on the bullet that killed him. Well, his DNA was, but not his blood. And the evidence certainly showed that. So... You know, he, he, but once again, it's him inserting himself into the case where a normal person wouldn't do that. Right, because he, he talks doublespeak about the cops. So in, in some of our texts, he's calling the cops pigs and how they messed up and how his swap view mentry is much better than what, what all of the cops did. Then, then on the other side, he's also saying that the cops did a great job and they solved this case and David is guilty and you all are basically wrong and, and crazy. So it's just, it's, it's a lot of double speak. So I think you're right. It started out for, for me, it started out as misinformation. And, and once I started looking at the factual data, uh, at the documents that anybody right now can go and find. You can go and check this stuff out. Um, then it's like, okay, either he didn't know or he's just, he's basically lying. And either either way, at that point, he's not really helping me to get to the, to the bottom of this case. It's just throwing sand in, in my eyes, pretty much. Correct, correct. Um, anything else on that one? Anyone got anything on this? Lies? Have you, have you guys, I don't know if you guys know, do you guys know that these goons have lied about this stuff, or is this all new information to you? No, I, it, <laughs> I've known about it since we started researching this case. <laughs> well, I did not know about the DHS and the FBI, and so that's why it just, it cracks me up. And the only mm -hmm. thing I would like to add here is that um, in, in my point of view, and in my opinion, this was him purposefully putting out disinformation. There are far too many lies. Everything he says was a lie and a distraction and a detraction. So the fact that he stated all of this to get people to go into a different direction was purposefully done. So to me, that makes it disinformation, in my opinion. Right, right which I think you're right on that, because he was kind of hoping that I would take whatever he was saying and just put it, put it out there and, mm -hmm. you know, let it, share it in our group at, at, that, at that time, which, you know, it's like, well, you're more than welcome to do that your, yourself. If you're going to feed me false stuff, if you're going to feed me these things, I'm not just going to put that out there. You know, I'm going to actually fact check it do some real fact checking on it and I'm going to hold on to this data until I can prove you right or prove you wrong. And there's just been a lot of a lot of that that we haven't really gotten time to to shine a spotlight on these guys. The yeah. way that they claimed they were going to shine that the DHS was going to shine a big spotlight on us. It was really more about Dan Hinnon shining a spotlight on him, shining a spotlight on Thomas Lapp, and somehow I was going to get involved in that that spotlight. I can only, I, I, I can only say that I know the same things that these goons contacted me with. I am sure there are many people out there that are listening to this. They probably contacted you too and said something very similar. Oh yeah, Sean, I think. I, yeah, he contacted you too, right? He contacted oh, yeah. a lot of people. Yep. Starts out nice. Right? He's your best oh, friend. Oh, no, he wasn't nice to me at all. He oh, was, he wasn't nice to you. Okay. He was rude from the get-go, and I'm just like, hey, dude, you don't know me. Don't talk to me like that. If you want to talk like a decent human, we can have a discussion. Otherwise, don't bother me. And, you know, then he pulled it back for a second, but then all of a sudden it's like, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. You're da-da-da-da-da, knock it off. And I'm like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> you don't even know me. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. And it was it was Mason Hendricks also that that told me directly that it was Sidra Comel's sister uh, that set up that GoFundMe to raise six million dollars for her ailing mother. Um, when we know that Dan probably set that up himself, and so he wanted to steer that away to make it look like it was done in good faith as well. And so, once again, I've got those uh, screenshots and I I saved the uh, correspondence and. Um, 
it's all very interesting. Now, for the newer listeners out there, and I think Stephen would uh, could benefit from this as well because he's fairly new into the case. The reason they talk about the DHS and the FBI signing off <clears throat> is because three or four months into this investigation, we were clamoring that why isn't this investigation done? Uh, what what what's what needs to be researched? And then it got to be six and seven months along, and they said there's nothing. There's, we're not done yet. We kept hearing this. And then it got to be nine, ten months along, and they said the investigation is still, we're still wrapping up, we're still wrapping up. And what we said was, if this is all nice and tied off in a nice little bow, and this was an easy investigation, what's taking so long? And so it came to be the January, the year later, that the investigation was done. It took a, a full year. And now looking at some of the, you know, the details and the reports, uh, they were waiting on a lot of things to come back and whatnot. But that's when, when we kept pushing is when um, Mason Hendricks responded back by, it needs to have federal sign-off before they can do it, uh, before it can be released to the public. And so that's when that, those kind of things came in. Then he says, you know, the FBI has got to sign off on all this. And so it was using it to placate us to say, just hang tight. It's more of a stall tactic because it's not it's not ready yet. It's not done. The reports and everything right. is done. It's not complete yet. But we were right. we were saying why wouldn't a case like this, the investigation, be wrapped up in in a, in a month or two or uh -huh. three months? Sure. Certainly not six right. months. Exactly. It, and so I wrote my way. first article when this was nine months old by saying how can this possibly take this long when we have all the information you need, official narrative that is. I said, here, you know, I went through my whole list uh, when I wrote that first uh, article about the case. Nine months in, we still didn't know anything. And so all that was going on those first nine months was uh, banter back and forth between people and members of the group uh, and, and characters like this. But then once that investigation got done, all this started making more sense. But that's where that came from. Uh, he was using it as an excuse that they needed to sign right. off. On, on everything right was well you, you know you know the, the way you explain it dan and i'm you know i'm catching up with that part of it today was very interesting like Catherine said about the, a dhs and the feds but um did he what what does he have a connection there i mean if he, if he was comfortable saying that blurting that out as brazen as he is maybe they'll throw him under the bus now but at that time he maybe felt he was untouchable and if he acted like that i mean like you say it's not normal for narcissists even narcissists and stuff but this is a this is a serious murder case this is, you know, like I said, I mean, a house fire or something. And I mean, he comes out that brazen, and those are some of his first statements. He's comfortable stating that. I mean, think that's that, yeah, maybe these guys, these guys were the hit guys, you know? It does go up higher. Apple Valley, taking that long for a case like this? At the Philip Marshall case, they closed that in, like, what, Greg? Less than a month, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and they actually I mean, had a whole summary. They gave us a whole summary of everything that they yeah did, exactly that, that these guys here we never got no dan you're absolutely right i mean yeah, apple valley is like they're, they're just playing dumb they're, they're, they're playing dumb <laughs> acting dumb i'm sorry acting dumb <laughs> I, I mean it's it's no dan the, the, you know there's no the, the questions are stellar and the answers are you know feeble <laughs> you know? yeah because there was also times that we were in communication with the uh, detectives uh, at the time, or at least Gummer was the lead detective, and I would shoot him an email uh, every couple of months and just saying, what is, this, what is the status uh, with the investigation? And they would respond. He'd say, you know what, we're probably uh, looking at another month before we get it finalized. Uh, and then yeah. the next time I, I asked, he said, you know, it's going to be another month or another few more weeks to go. We're putting the finishing touches on all this. And what we found out later was when all this was done, they had already been filming, filming their Fox 9 investigative report with with Tom Lydon and that was already a shot and and down and in the can ready to ready to uh, go live the night they released everything so they were doing all this other media and social media type of things uh, behind the scenes so they were ready to go when the news broke when this is all released that they had the bases covered on everything and so that's I think also what was taking so long in this but this was back when we were still in good communication uh, Greg was talking to Gummert I was and, and things like that. So we were getting email responses, uh, you know, from those guys. They just kept delaying it. We thought maybe it's a stall tactic because at that point we just still didn't know if it was a cover-up or, or what the uh, what the story was. 
because in some of these cases they never get they never get concluded and therefore you can never ask questions or file a FOIA until the case is complete. So we thought at this point, uh, those of us who were right on the case in the very beginning thought they're never going to finish this case so they can never allow us to do a FOIA request on anything to get any of the information. Sure. Absolutely. And so once they did, you know, a year later, then we started getting the data that, that we needed. But at first, we didn't know if we were hemming and hawing, thinking, are they being legit? They're trying to, you know, wrap this up. Or are we going to be hearing this for the next 15 years that they're still wrapping it up and it's still open? But sometimes they'll keep cases open like that on purpose so the public can't get any information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And it's also and interesting how, how, that when – go ahead, Steve. Oh, no, I just say how long the Warren report take, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah, and and there's still there's still a lot of questions on, on that one today. Well, yeah, yeah, but anyway. That this, but no, that's yeah. a long time, Dan. Yeah. And, and even after we did get – because remember, at, at first, all that we got was uh, 94 pages of police reports – and then we got 464 photos. That was it. We didn't get any DNA stuff. We didn't get any coroner stuff. There were, we didn't get any of the phone records, the financial records, none of that. We had none of that stuff. So during most of, of this time when I'm talking with these goons, I don't know any of that stuff yet. So I don't have any counters, and they know that too. So they, they're free to tell me whatever they want to, knowing that I can either take it seriously or I can try to, you know, um, keep my mouth shut, or you know, or I can say that that they're wrong with them knowing that I don't have the facts to prove that they're wrong at that time. Obviously, later on, all of that changed. Um, that's kind of the thing, you know. If, if I only knew then what I what I know now, um, maybe their answers would have been a lot a lot different. But it just it, there's a, a lot of stuff like that. So we didn't know. And in the, in the 94 pages that we got, all of these things, the only things that were, that were censored, they didn't censor any phone numbers, any addresses, anything like that. I did all of that. The only thing that was censored was any mention of the blood writing or of the Quran. That was it. You know, they, they mentioned notes, but they didn't say what was on those notes. They tried to hide all of that stuff from us. The Muslim angle what was the Muslim angle. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, uh, just to clarify uh, for Stephen, what we did, and I agree with Greg, is in those first months, we had nothing really to go on. So we did our best to just monitor and document all these phrases, get screenshots, see what they were saying, and then I built the timeline when all these things came into us. Not the crime, not the timeline for the crime and, and the investigation of the crime, but a timeline of the answers we were getting and the facts that we were getting sent to us and the things that were happening uh, in the background. More of the aftermath, because then once the police reports came, we were able to go through then and dissect and, and prove that these things didn't happen or the timings it didn't make sense or things like that. So we were busy documenting all of this in the in the first year. Who was contacting us? Who was reaching out? Who were the constant main players that kept that kept showing up in the scene that, that kept inserting themselves? And then we had a constant array of Facebook profile people contacting us as well. And it turned out to be the same same people with uh, different pseudonyms and and, and fake fake book, uh, Facebook profiles. And so I had to keep a, a matrix of all of the people who was on Facebook under different usernames trying to instant message us under, uh, you know, on good faith. Hey, I'm trying to find out about, about the case. You know, what can you tell me? And I find out later that uh, it was a Facebook page that was created the day before. No friends, no, no interests, no photos. Mm -hmm. And uh, it ties to another friend that was created the next the, the day before, also that uh, you know that, that Sean Wright knew or, or Mason Hendricks knew. So it was the same creatures were coming out and rearing their heads, and all we're trying to play whack a mole with all the same characters. <laughs> that's that's what we're you know, doing. Dan, the the sixty thousand dollar question is why are they doing this? And that's it. Why? I mean, if nobody does this, and then you keep coming, we come to that. Um, and they're, 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 that kind of effort, which is not a big 
you know, stroke of genius, but I mean, you know, there, there's definitely motive there to put Facebook profiles up and you got you smart, you look, there's nothing there, there's no meat to it, you know, and if you link it to whomever, whomever. Um, well, I read super red flag. I mean, what's their, you know, what do these guys want? <laughs> you know? And it's only going to get more interesting in the next paragraph. Mm hmm. So we've got Mason yeah. Hendricks pretty much covered in, in this about all of his, and I call them shenanigans, because it's the same people inserting themselves and calling us conspiracy theorists. And at the same time, we'd say, well, if we're a conspiracy theorist um, and you already know what happened in the case, why are you giving us the time of day? Uh, I know that I wouldn't go on a, on a random uh, conspiracy site and, and start uh, egging on people about things that I don't believe, nor would, would I even care about. Why would I spend my time that way? And so they never had an answer for that, unless they'd come back and say that, you know, we're doing this for the family. We're doing this. They, they, they'd inserted an emotional uh, attachment somewhere. This is where we thought mm -hmm. that there were uh, federal operatives or agents involved because they were always throwing the emotional angle on it. And then anytime someone from the general public who was starting to follow the case that didn't know a lot about it would jump on and then agree with them by saying, you know what, you you guys are really going after the family. You know, what's your problem? Maybe you guys are the bad guys. And they would take the sides of, you know, Sean or Mason, Danny August Mason, and everyone else, because they'd bring an emotional element to the case and make us look bad. And that's, a, and that's clearly a tactic to do precisely that. And so we knew then at that point that they were not novice uh, folks out there just trying to derail us. They were, they, they were, they, they were, doing the heavy hitting stuff that would uh, really try to discredit us. Everyone in our group that was on our side, uh, they went after to try to you know, discredit our whole group. Anyone that was supporters of Dan and Greg at the beginning, um, they were all nut jobs, nut cases, they called us. Mm -hmm. So we see that in today in, in actual real life stories, but I'll continue on here with the, uh, the next uh, session. Was Mason Hendricks also wrong when he stated the pact theory came from David's parents? There's no evidence of a pact between David and Kamel to commit suicide and murder their five-year-old daughter, but that hasn't stopped some from trying to connect those dots. David Crowley's neighbor, Judy Prochnow, still believes there was a pact between David and Kamel to ascend out of this world by committing a double suicide murder. Even so, Judy told me, I don't think Dan or Kate Crowley, this is the parents of David, um, I don't know for sure, but I don't think they, they didn't want to believe that David even did it. So I don't think they even thought of a pack theory, end quote. All right, what, what, right who wants to jump on that, uh, Catherine? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, the old pack theory, huh? <laughs> you know that didn't even come from the police the police never even really said much about that but these guys sure did but again I just see it as they come up with so many different stories like you had stated um, well somebody had stated earlier you know they're they're just throwing out as many ideas as they can possibly think of just to keep the focus off of themselves but at the same time they're trying to sound important I just can't take anything they say seriously. So well, I'd just like to add uh, what Dan was saying earlier about how they would go after those who believed that there was more to the story than what we were being told and uh, weren't believe believing the official narrative. All of us are still being attacked to this day. And they're still pushing the pack theory to this day. Oh, and, okay. you know, it's, it it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I would say uh, a pack theory makes sense with two uh, adults. You usually see it with a girlfriend, boyfriend, or a, or a married couple or something that are involved with uh, drugs or some kind of other uh, element, hallucinations, uh, satanic element, you know, whatever. We've seen the pack theories to that effect where that has actually happened. Never have I seen anything that I've read or researched that involves a child or a, a five-year-old daughter that includes that. So right away that raised red flags 
uh, about that. Um, but then they kept pushing it. Now the fact right. that they pushed it, there was no evidence. There was nothing. Usually, a pact like that, there would be something in the suicide note. There'd be something explaining it. There would be something. Here's what we're doing, and here's what we want to do, and uh, here's how we want to get to that. Uh, here's the means to the end to get there. Well, there was nothing. There was no evidence to support that anyway. So they inserted the pact theory. And now we get Judy Proc, now the neighbor who comes in and gets involved because uh, now we've got to ask the next question is, is why, why is she a neighbor, seemingly has nothing to do with the case other than just being a neighbor, inserting herself into a Justice for David Crowley Facebook group. And so then yeah. she comes in now and starts you know, taking sides on different things. And then you know, this was, her first appearance was February 14th of 2015 just less than a month uh, after everything started and everything, you know, she was quiet and then, it, then she came on full force in, in February. But she also agrees to this day that there's a pact uh, in, in all of this, uh, all, all of these things. But there's no support. There's no, there's no evidence. There's no documentation. There's nothing ever to say that here's where we got that from or here's why we believe it. Um, sure. You know, there, 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 there'd, be more, there'd be more notes. It wouldn't, I mean, the thing is so sloppy and, no, there's, there's, you know, what, what, a pack theory like that. No, it would have been, it would have been, you know, maybe if a guy went nuts, he still loves his family, so it wouldn't be that messy. Um, there's no pack theory. And we have to keep in mind too that Judy has said on numerous occasions, which are even, you know, um, notes that she's written and, and conversations she's had back and forth, is that she admits she didn't even know this family. So if she doesn't know the family. How does she feel qualified to even make a judgment call based on a patch theory that's coming from someone that has been lying to her? Oh, How sure. does that make sense? Uh, it doesn't. And she's, well, she's also admitting that anything that she knows about David and Kamel, she has learned throughout the years after their death from online posts and from the reports that the police have written. She's admitted this openly. Yeah, so it's not direct. It's it's secondhand knowledge on mm -hmm. all of those, uh, those those statements. That's correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. No. It's just weird that that she would still think that there was a pact. Now you have Sean Wright who also believes that there was this this pact. So they can they if they believe that there is a pact, then they then they are on our side at some level that they understand that this sure. is not a double murder suicide. They can't have it both ways. Either they they think that this is a double murder suicide, like the police do, or they are also going against what the police say. They are also creating now their own theory, a third theory, which is freaking nuts when you really think about it. Yeah. Um, this is when things change, okay? Um, Hendricks, Hendricks was the only one that went back on this pack theory. He's, he's definitely the smartest out of all of these goons, definitely, from what I can see. Um, maybe, not, maybe smart is not the right term, but this was damage con control here. When they start telling people, David Crowley's friends, David Crowley's family, David Crowley's fans, when they start telling them, that there is a pack theory here that not only did David do this, but that Kamel did this too. They yeah. lost a lot of the sympathy that they had gained. Completely lost. A lot of people who were willing to think that maybe David was guilty, when they started saying, well, now Kamel's guilty too, they lost a lot of different people. Probably... I don't know this for sure, but I'm, you know, I'm uh, assuming a lot of probably Camille's family, too, saw that they were full of crap at that point. Finally, you have um, the, the documentary was about a pack theory that if you really watch it, it's subconsciously supposed to show you that there was a pact between David and his wife to kill themselves and kill their five year old daughter. It's crazy. It's craziness. Uh, it is correct about the documentary leading you down that path. 
and they used the recordings that Kamel and David made at the end of August and then again at the end of October as their reasons for why they're saying it's a pack theory and that Kamel put the idea into David's head. This is not coming from me. This is coming from them. And if you listen to those recordings with headphones on, you can hear where the edits took place for them to put it into the documentary. So we're not hearing the true recordings. We're hearing edited, highly edited versions of them, the recordings, that they wanted us to hear in that documentary to lead us down that path that, yes, Kamal was supposedly crazy, and I'm saying that in quotation marks, and that she and David made this pact, and then at the very end, you know, they they committed this horrendous act. So here's a here's a statement. I think uh, Greg, see if if you'll agree with this. If, if this is very early when this is all first happening and and everything was boiling over. Uh, they said it was a a pact, and then like you said, is they lost a lot of support from what I would say is the mothers and the female females and mothers out there because they automatically says, wait, are you suggesting Comel was in on murdering our daughter? What mer- what mother? What parent would even do that? And so that's when a lot of people also started joining the group, and that's, a lot, that's when a lot of people started falling away from uh, the, the goons, I guess, on the Gray State group, because they're like, you expect me to believe that Kamel was involved in killing the killing of Rania? I don't think so. So we started getting a big influx of uh, females and mothers uh, started joining on. And that's where I got most of my uh, direct messages and instant messages from folks uh, because they'll still still watch the movie and say, well, this doesn't make any sense. And it's not guys. It's not men. It's mainly females that say, well, there's no way. So I think that's when they had to craft it to become, you know what, she was crazy. Uh, She was hallucinating and she was crazy. Even though they had a pack, she wasn't in her right mind because that didn't, you know, she was in her right mind, that didn't play well. That Mothers didn't agree with that. Parents didn't agree with it. Uh, they, they know, anyone who's a parent, you would just know that you would not kill your child, uh, no matter what was going on. So I think then they had to insert the hallucination, the drugs, and everything else to say, you know what, she was crazy. And that's what we see in the documentary. The Eric Nelson report is, she's crazy, he's crazy, they're both crazy, uh, there was some kind of a pact. I think that is a subliminal message in that whole movie t- is that what you end yeah. leaving with is that it's a pact. And I think yeah. that's where that movie, when people see it, uh, normal parents watching the movie, the mm-hmm. first thing they do when the movie's over is they do a, a research uh, onto how to find the justice page and then leave us a note by mm-hmm. saying, I want to join the group because I don't believe it. The whole thing's BS. I hardly huh. get males or men that direct message me after seeing the movie. It's always the female and usually mothers that say, there's just no way any mother would do that to a five-year-old daughter. Right. I call so yes. So I think that's what's really oh, helped yeah, us. No. Help us out yeah. is the uh, is the Eric and and the guys who did the, the, this behind all these shenanigans and narratives. None of them are parents. Only David was. Sean Sean Wright uh, had had a, a young daughter at, at the time, but they were the ones introducing these theories that. Uh, Without, I, I don't think they consult, you know, any any mother or a female before they started introducing these theories because they, they it didn't it fell on its face when they tried to insert these uh, these speculations. Well, did, yeah, Dan, if, if, if I can go ahead, Jack, you're absolutely right. Um, but you also have you do have those cases with the gal drove her kids into the ocean and drowned them, and there, there, there does happen. But here's what I'm saying: what, going along with that narrative is that to see uh, uh, the parents collaborate for a pact to do that to their child is, I think, has probably never even happened hardly. That, I can say, that is, you know what I'm saying? One, one might go this way or that way, or there's no pact to kill your child between two of them. There's always the, the mother well, might take that that's happened before, and the father, you know, you don't see them both uh, conspiring to do something and making a deal like that. I, I've never heard of that. You know what I mean? Well, Stephen, yeah, correct. Stephen what, what, I mean, no what way. type of proof? What, what type of proof, Stephen, would you need 
to see, to say, okay, yeah, maybe there was a pact. Maybe there was a pact. But then what type of proof would you need to say, yes, I believe there definitely was? Because I'm not seeing any of that here. No, no way, Greg. You know, they'd have to be, you know, something like that. The parents uh, made a pact. I think there might have been a, be, be a note to the family, we're sorry or something. You know, I mean, that's a very emotional planned out, I mean, that the, the, the goes through your mind to do that, for both parents to collaborate to do that, I think you would have, I mean, there'd be a note, I, I, I would call that. And not only that, um, the so-called um, uh, suicide note on the thing wouldn't say, I have loved you all with all of my heart. It would have said, we have exactly. loved you. So they Good left point. that out. And another point I wanted to bring yeah. out, too, that these numb nuts didn't think about is that we have it on, there's um, audio of when, um, you know, Camille is talking to David and she's like, she's asking, well, am I crazy? A crazy, doesn't, a crazy person doesn't ask if they're crazy. They don't know that. They're, they're so far gone, they can't see that they're crazy. Yeah. So the simple yeah. fact that she's asking, this is scary. She was so afraid. She was scared is what she was. She was not crazy. So I, w I really wish I could just stuff a sock in some of these people's mouths. I know no, I that I was one of those female viewers who watched the video and immediately started looking up the group after I finished watching the video or the movie. I, I mean, it made no sense, and I had way too many questions at the end, and I knew I'd, I had just been lied to. And that's how I came to the group was watching that documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the demo, that's the main demographic is the uh, is the parents or, or mothers or uh, you know females that have uh, children that they just they watch it and they they're flabbergasted that how can this even transpire? How, how does this happen? And it's right because we know that there was no pact. And uh, it's not a theory. It did, it did not happen. There is no, there never was a pact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Judy goes on to say that I'm guessing that the parents don't believe it because they don't want to. Now, that's a fact. I would, I would say that most parents, after this took place, are not going to believe if there was a pact that one took place. So Judy's right in laying the foundation there by saying, you know what, it's probably going to take a while for them to come around to, to even buy that or even subscribe to that theory. That is a fact. But then she says, uh, you know, maybe they never even thought of it, you know, you know who, who knows. But the question is, why is Judy inserting herself at all in, in any of this? Uh, right. Now, the best part is yet to come. The quote says next, Judy says, no one was in the house before the cleaners, end quote. This is, this is the statement that she says. And I'm going to end right there, not even going on to the further statement. She has said this, and, and this, this statement has, has been said multitude of times. Now, because we've got the reports, the investigation reports, the police reports, the date, the 911 uh, suspicious person call, um, we know that they were in the house. So that's the, that's the question. Why would she say that? Now, what she's saying, why is she saying that is she says, because... I'm the neighbor. There was no one going in and out of the house until the cleaners were done and signed off and you know finished their job. She's saying that on authority. So I think that's when they had to bring, maybe that's when they had to bring her into this because now she's a credible witness as the next door neighbor to say, you know what, no one was there. Um, but I think that's, she's playing a role there. She's playing the, uh, the credible neighbor role. But we know for a fact they were in there before. Yeah, which, which actually down. leads toward the theory that um, there were people in and out of that house even while the crime was being committed. It, because if she didn't see these, these two, you know, Mason Hendricks and Chris Klein, who state they were there, they openly say, we were in that house. And then Judy's like, well, no, nobody was there. Well, obviously, oh. she wasn't good enough to, she wasn't as astute of, of an ops, you know. Oh, um, you know what? You know, she she's she's Gladys Kravitz, guys. You know what? <laughs> I, I, I looked at the pro, I looked at the proximity of the of the residences, and you know what? There's no way you couldn't miss it. I'm a, I mean, I'm still surprised that, that, that they didn't hear the gunshots. I mean, really. I mean, she's she's watching out that window every day. 
Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, come on. You know, that's what I'm going to my call. <laughs> I call her so is she protecting the gray state guys then? No, somebody I mean, got to her. Somebody, no, to some, 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 hey, some, somebody, somebody with a federal badge got to her. That's that. Somebody walked in there, or even could have been even been a sergeant from the, the department. Somebody, some sort of authority. Yes, Sophia, they got in there, got to her. Yeah. She got some backlash. She got a lot of backlash from the gray state goons after after our quote unquote debate that I did with her for some of her statements, and this was one of those statements there um, that she, I, I know she got or maybe she doesn't know that she got backlash, they may not have even told her but they told me <laughs> so I know that there was some backlash based on some of these statements that she had made that the Gray State goons um, had countered. Yeah, I think Catherine had the best statement there that uh, you know, Mason himself has agreed and, and said it in writing publicly that he was in the house before the cleaners were done, uh, admitted to it. So mm -hmm. the question comes into play as to why is she inserting herself or why was she told to make that statement or why did she push so heavy on that statement? And it only con con concludes, concludes is, is, is she compromised or is she, you know, doing the bidding of someone else? Did, did someone talk to her to, to say, you know what, you got to get that set that record straight because we're going to have egg on our face if we find out other people were in there. And so maybe someone with the badge did say, you know what, set the story straight on this because uh, we're going to look incompetent if this story gets out sure. as, as, as to what actually happened. So that could very well be the case. But I think that she was playing a role there. Uh, mm -hmm. She was. And, you know, and you know if, 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 if I was a crooked investigator, I would get to all those neighbors and I would get them on our narrative right away. As soon as the cops show up, that's official narrative. I don't care what anybody else says. And Chris Klein can go over and bring him, you know, a, a bunt, bunt cake. You know, it doesn't, that doesn't, that's not going to mean anything. First time, boom, authorities, yep, it happened, and give them the narrative. Just like in the grassy knolls and everybody saw the, the smoke, you know. Hey, give them the narrative, you know. That's, that's what now happened. The, the, next, the next sentence is, is, is very telling because, once again, it gives us the answer. Judy goes on to say that, Quote, Chris Klein and them were in the house the day after the cleaners called about finding the bullet. End quote. Or Greg goes on to say then that when I reminded Judy that Klein was in the house on January 19th, she responded with, quote, well, the cops may might have said that, but they weren't. Judy believes Chris Klein was just wrong about the date he was at the Crowley home. He just must have gotten the dates mixed up. End quote. Wow. <laughs> see, this is so repeating get, that. They're backtracking. Now you're, you're starting to backpedal on some of the things saying you got it wrong. So when I go and get the suspicious report for the FOIA request for that 9-11, uh, when I get the 9-11 phone call on, on the 19th, that's when the phone call with a neighbor called for suspicious activity in the house. That was the 19th. That was not wrong. The 9-11 dispatch didn't get it wrong. That was the 19th. Cleaners weren't done until the 20th or after. So yeah, which feeds into what Stephen was just saying. It that feeds into the fact that something, there's a narrative break here and someone's trying to fix it. Right. And so that this is all we're dealing with here. It's a lot of just uh, hearsay to try to... Uh, fix the problem they don't they don't want the neighbor's narrative to be their own narrative if it goes above the pay grade of apple valley okay i mean you know let's you know we're taking care of this quickly who's first on the scene apple valley they knew what was going on it was the fbi first on the scene with black suits and white shirts and ties it'd be a different story that would be the narrative she'd have didn't see anything it'd be like men in black give her the zapper you know same thing it's just you know somebody got to her because there's a big there's a to say it'd be, there's some, there's some uh, you know, slides missing in that video, like you said, Dan. You know, that something's missing right there in the narrative. It's like a change, you know, change of change of heart, or that's a narrative that she's going with, and you know. And, 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 and also, it's interesting to note too that she doesn't follow it up or end her statement with, you know, I, I, I could be wrong, or this is what I think is, is true, but I'm open to any other scenarios. Uh, you know, she's insisting that this happened on this date and on this time. She's insisting. She yeah. is not planting the seed and hoping for you to buy it. Uh, she's insisting that you 
believe right. her story with no that, evidence is what she's doing. Dan, that, that, Dan, that's exactly right. The badges show up. They're the authority. This is what you're going to say. You did, 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 she's the closest. Na- if you went across to couple, talk to a couple more neighbors, I bet you they're going to tell you the same thing because that's what they did. They went in there. She said, she's, the, she's the eyewitness to whatever happened. We know it's a murder and it's a cover-up. She's the eyewitness. We need her on our side. Here's her narrative. You hit it right on, Dan. And it wasn't anyone else. It wasn't Sean Wright making no. these uh, statements or Mason or Danny August Mason. It was right. Judy because she was the next door neighbor. It had to come from her right. mouth to lend credibility yeah. to that what she was saying was was true. So <laughs> now the question is now the question is why I is would. she lying? The question is why is she lying because now this isn't misinformation she didn't get the dates wrong this is disinfo right uh, in other words a lie why is the neighbor lying in a triple homicide case from next door yeah so yeah. that that's question number one that if i was uh, detective gummert would be all over I'd go her. right to her well yeah but detective gummert probably told her what to say correct but in, in a perfect world right. yeah you'd have your detective in a perfect world yeah yeah no exactly but Point is, is that that's what I just said. I, I you know, if I had a one one I did a one way ticket and go back there for vacation. Not you would door. think I, each one of these detectives you know? would have been at her door knocking the very next day by oh, saying, you know absolutely. what, things oh, don't add up. Yeah. None of this adds up. No, you, you know, know what? You can't miss the neighborhood. I mean, you know what? I mean, you go down blocks because somebody might have been parked down there in a strange car last week that we haven't seen or ever seen a block and a half away. You know, I mean, you know, it's it's a serious crime. You know, I mean. Yeah, that, that, that's a you know that's a really good a, a bullet point, Dan. I'm just that neighbor. I, I'm learning about her more. What, you know, her narr- her narrative was, but what I can see is that she was definitely coached. Very coached. Good good phrase. She was coached. Yep. Yeah. Now it goes Thanks, on to man. say, and I think this, <laughs> Greg, this next paragraph uh, may be the most important one of this uh, of this chapter. It says, to be clear, Chris Klein and the others were in the house on January 19th. The cleaners didn't find the bullet that rolled out of the carpet until January 20th. The date in Detective Bones' report and in the incident detail report are clear. I think it's Judy who got the dates mixed up, not anyone else. So what Greg's doing here is he's laying out the, the evidence, almost like a court case, by saying both reports are similar and consistent. There's not an error. Uh, the officer didn't get the dates wrong. It was legit. So everything, we know the cleaners found it on the 20th. We know Klein was in the house on the 19th, which means they were in the house before the cleaners were done. The bullet rolled out on the 20th. All reports are consistent. If anyone's lying, it's Judy. So now the big the question you know, remains, uh, why is she spreading disinformation? I'm just complimenting Greg, saving this for, toward the end. It's really kind of um, suspenseful. The, uh, what was that, Greg? I, I was just saying that, you know, she's basically saying that the cops got it got it wrong. You know, so she got it right. The cops got it wrong. Who is she taking orders from? Like, where is she getting this information that the cops got it wrong? And according to her, she wasn't the one who called 911. So how would she even know to begin with? She would have to know like, the person except, who called 911 at least. Right? Hey, you know what? She, she, she's recanting or changing statements. Somebody else got to her a different narrative. Mm-hmm. That was another yep. thing that got that's her. It. Got yeah, that's some it, man. I mean, you got, you got the you got the, go- you got the gospel with the badge, in timely in the, on the murder case, and all of a sudden she's saying something else. I mean, that tells me it came from the top, I mean, or somebody else in you know higher rank or whatever. And, and by the way, it's a narrative, you know, to, more more toward you know um, murder suicide or, or homicide three homicides what, what's her narrative changed toward more is it, is it an advantage to the investigation or not now it goes on to say the quote from judy the neighbor she says whoever called judy continued took down the license plates s plural of the cars s plural that were there and called in to police one of them was chris klein's and I know one of them was Mason's. Hendricks. 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 That's right. So she said she admits that she wasn't the one who called, and I'm assuming this is the, the 911 call that came in on January 19th, where another neighbor d- down the road called in. She's saying that it wasn't her, but she said that they took down the license plates. 
of the cars, and she uses plural both times. Is that correct, Greg? That is correct. Okay. I always thought that there was one vehicle. That's what I thought. According to the police re report or to the document that Dan Hinnon got, it only talks about one person, only talks about one car. <laughs> oh, you just showed your hand, Judy. And not only that, in the police report, they couldn't figure out who the person was that was there, and she's saying she knows one of them was Mason Hendricks. So how does she know the police don't know? Yeah, and he was not happy about this statement, by the way, <laughs> that she made. I can't not imagine. Happy at all. <laughs> And so this explains also how they tracked down Chris Klein. Remember, uh, people in the group were asking, you know, uh, when that suspicious call came to 911, how did they know it was him? And so this would explain the license plate written down. They would call it in. They looked it up. They tracked it back to a guy named Chris Klein. They went and visited him. He wasn't there. It took till next the following month before they contacted uh, him. And he says, oh, we're upstairs looking for an attic, uh, in the attic looking for the bullet. And they're like, wait, what now? <laughs> so they also must have had Mason's, Hendricks, if the license plates were written down, meaning both. Hmm. Did they ever do a follow-up with Mason Hendricks is, is my next question that I never even thought of yet until just tonight. Nope. He is not mentioned anywhere in any of the documents that we have. He is not mentioned at all. Oh, that's right. Now, does Stephen know this? Stephen, even when we got the 94-page police report from Apple Valley, Nowhere does it mention Mason Hendricks is even involved in this case whatsoever as a, as a friend, as a witness, as a statement, to, no, to no, receive no, a statement, no, nothing. No, no, no contact, no witness. No, he's not listed anywhere with the source power on the reports or anything. And he's wiped nothing. clean. There's not, no mention and, of him at all. And he is, he nothing is one of the last nothing. people. Okay. You know what? Um, he, is, he, is, he is one of the last people, Stephen, to, to see David to show up at David's house. He was sanitized. No police report, nothing. The, the, the Dan, good word, Dan. There you go. <laughs> Great. Sanitized, yeah. Now, would, would, I mean, you call Hendricks the leader of the uh, henchmen, or would you call Mason the leader of the henchmen? Well, if you talk to Sean, Sean's the leader. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this, you know, you, you, listen, you, you, you got a, you got a bunch of A-types in this thing. I mean, this thing... I think this thing's ready to implode, explode, what have you. I mean, I think we stay on this thing. Somebody's going to, I mean, step under you know what. Um, there's, I mean, these guys, every time you mention one or the other, you, you can, it's, it's comical almost when these guys respond. Um, but, yeah, Hendricks not being anywhere as a contact, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Maybe I'll look into that. His name and his, you know, a name, address, phone number, who spoke with him to get a witness statement or any kind of a statement uh, is not mentioned. His name is not in wow. that report. No. Greg, is it true on that 488-page report, if you do a, a PDF find or a search on the last name or first name Hendricks, uh, it, it comes back with no results? That's right. Wow. No kid. So he's the only one sanitized in this whole thing. But when the Fox 9 report did the sit-down interview, uh -huh. He was the lead yeah. star telling the narrative. They had him playing another role as laying down the narrative, saying how much they loved each other. And uh, Comel would finish David's sentences and all this tying in the emotional aspect of uh, oh, how they were such good friends. And then at the same time, he would you know, admit that he would tell David that, you know, I I'll, I'll get her, I, you know, I'll take her from you. And... I mean, he talks out of both sides of his mouth all the time, constantly. So, so, oh, Catherine, I'm sorry. So, so Hend Hendrix was after uh, David's wife. He had the hots for her, for sure. Really? Yes. Man, there's a mo there's so much motive with this guy. Man, this guy, this guy is like sanitized, like Dan says. You know, I mean, what, and he's a he's a Freemason also. Well, he's really into the, the Norse religion and paganism and stuff like that. And um, I can't I tie pages. him directly to Freemasonry, but I can definitely tie Mason, uh, Danny August Mason, into Freemasonry. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. Yes. So Hendrix is more into pagan, but that, that's, you know, yeah. that's bohemian. That's bohemian stuff anyway, so. Yep. Yeah, okay. Now, the very, well, then no. there you go. There's your point, because aren't most of them Freemasons? 
Oh, the He Man Club, they're, they're everything. Freemasons, yeah. everything. Yeah, okay. they're Illuminati, the whole nine yards. <laughs> So I think here in the final paragraph is where we get our answer. It says, based on a call about suspicious activity, Detective Bone went looking for a, quote, suspicious person, not plural, person, not persons. Item 57 is one of many reasons why this case should be reopened and reexamined. End of the chapter. Right there. So that's why they never followed up. Judy says that the neighbor wrote down two license plates. She knew one was Klein. She knew one was Mason Hendricks. Police followed up on only one, which we know was Chris Klein. They never followed up on Mason Hendricks. So once again, any mention of anything that he's even connected to has been sanitized out. Wow. Dan, great find, man. Yeah, you too, Greg. I'm sorry. Great find. That's yeah. awesome. I did, not, I did not know that. And she herself, Judy, so that's why... See, that's why Mason Hendricks was upset with Judy's comment, Greg, because he wasn't supposed to have any part of anything, and now she throws his name, uh, throws his name in, in the, into the ring. If he didn't want his name attached to the case, he should have never done the interviews. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if he wanted his name attached, but I know it sounds like to me, and I think Stephen can agree that for some reason his name was eliminated uh, from this altogether. Not not one well, Dan, mention. I, 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 you know, yeah, I couldn't give yeah. you a reason, Dan, except that this thing stinks to high heaven like we've been talking about. But and now is, Judy makes the statement and kind of that. brings her, his uh, you know, name into the, into the mix with an actual license yeah. plate at the scene before the crime scene was clean. Mm -hmm. And police, in, in, in particular, Detective Bone, only follows up with Klein, not both license plate numbers that he was assigned to research, mm -hmm. but just right. one. Yeah, he's, he's also one of the first people that is, um, if you go back to the early news reports, you'll find a lot of his quotes in there. So he's out there saying, you know, I don't know what happened, David wouldn't do this, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there were two notes, they don't make, make, make sense. So he's out there from, from the very start. It's really odd that there's no police report or anything on, on him at all. And that's all that I've got. That's all I've got for this uh, chapter, uh, Suspicious Activity, uh, for Chapter 9 in Greg Fernandez Jr.'s book, The Gray Stage.